This morning we are now breaking into uh, John chapter 15, a very familiar passage. We're going to be looking this morning at that uh, analogy I've already told you that Jesus uses to liken our relationship to Him. We are like branches connected to a vine, and we have to be connected if we are to bear good fruit. And of course, we're going to see the... Uh, the other side of the coin, which is if we're not connected to Him, then we're looking forward basically to a furnace of fire, to hell, unless we repent and turn to Jesus Christ. But the overarching majority of this text, the theme, is that of joy and how we can have it. So let's, let's go ahead and read the text and we'll see that this is in fact what Jesus is talking about. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean or pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. May the Lord bless this part of His Word to our understanding and our edification this morning. Now, last time we saw Jesus saying that if we love Him we will obey Him. And this reminded us of two things. That first of all, this is how Jesus wants us to show Him that we love Him. He doesn't want us just to say it, though He certainly delights in that. He doesn't want us to think, just think about it, though He certainly does delight in our thinking, or simply feel it, you know, this warm, fuzzy feeling, I love Jesus. He wants us to show Him that we love Him by the way that we live, commensurate with our relationships and where we happen to be in our growth. Children, you show that love by honoring and obeying your parents. And as adults, we do that, of course, in a variety of ways, but it boils down to keeping the commandments. Secondly, this is how we can know that we really do love Jesus. Because if our love doesn't go beyond what we say, if it doesn't go beyond what we're thinking or what we're feeling in our lives, there's a disconnect somewhere. It's possible that our love is, is simply weak, but it's also possible that it just isn't there, that we really don't love Him. Now, if that's the case, if there are no works, if there is no fruit, which should be there if we love Jesus, then what we need to do is look to Jesus and ask Him to give to us the gift of His Holy Spirit so that we can love Him, so that we can trust Him, so that we can obey Him. Now, we also saw that Jesus promised His disciples that if they already had His Spirit with them, which they knew they did, if they were loving Him and if they were obeying Him, which again they were, that there was something even better that was coming. More of the Spirit's work, more of His power, uh, which He sent at Pentecost, uh, Pentecost, that the Spirit of God would begin to indwell them 
and make them to be living temples and from the inside out transform their lives. Jesus said not only would he help them to remember everything he had told them, not only would he continue to teach them and lead them into everything they needed to know in order to serve him so that they could write it down for us, which they did in the Gospels and the New Testament letters, he would also give them greater power to do even more to push the kingdom forward. And the way he does that, of course, is by giving to us a greater love for him, a greater desire, a greater zeal to see the kingdom of heaven move forward, to see Jesus Christ glorified. Again, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me more, you'll keep them more. Well, they were going to get more of that love at Pentecost when the Spirit of God came. And now we live post-Pentecost, so we already have access to that love, and the Spirit of God already indwells us if we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this brings us to the topic of our passage. The Spirit was going to give them more power, power to be able to do more because they would love Jesus more. And this, in turn, would bring to them an even greater blessing, which we saw in verse 11. They would be filled with joy. Now, this morning, what I would like for us to consider from this passage is how we can have this joy that Jesus promised his disciples. Now, actually, we know Jesus, we already have it, but we need to see the connection where the joy comes from. Now, first of all, again, I want to remind you that this is what Jesus is talking about. He is telling us that we can have joy, and he is showing us how we can have joy. He tells us this in verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Now, I don't know that Jesus is talking about just the things we've read from verses 1 through 11, but perhaps it has to do with everything that Jesus has said up to this point in the Upper Room Discourse, because Jesus has been speaking to comfort his disciples in light of the fact that he had just told them he was going to go away, he was going to go back to heaven. He told them that even though he was going to heaven, they shouldn't be troubled, they shouldn't be afraid. It shouldn't worry them or concern them that he's gone now because the reason he was going was to prepare a place for them in heaven. Now, Jesus has done the same thing for you if you're trusting him. He has gone to prepare a place for you, which means you should not be troubled either, but rather be assured that the one who loves you will never let you go, but will bring you safely to heaven. He will bring you all the way. Now, he also told them not to be afraid because... Even though he was leaving, he would not leave them as orphans. You know, Jesus essentially had been their father during the last three and a half years. His ministry to them was one of of provision, one of protection, one of instruction. In every way, he was a father to them. But even though he was leaving, he tells them he was not going to abandon them, as we saw last week. He was going to come to them again in the presence of His Spirit. He says He would come and abide with them, that He and His Father would come and dwell within them. And what He meant by that was He was coming in the Spirit. And now, to give them even further comfort, He says this coming will actually give them more joy. Joy because of what they would be able to do once He came in this way, once the Spirit came. They would not only be able to do what he had done, but they would do greater things. Remember, we saw some of those greater things last time. Now, if you really love Jesus and want to show him that you do love him by obeying him, what could possibly give you a greater joy and pleasure than having the power to do exactly that, to obey more, that you might express your love more to him? So how is it they could have this power, and how can we have this power so that we can experience this joy? Well, Jesus says we need to be connected to Him. Now, I need to just skip around a little bit because, as you you can see, this particular text is kind of marbled with some positive and negative things. So I'm going to draw together the positive things right now 
to point out what Jesus said would bring us joy, although I have to admit, I think we'd all see that when we see what the Lord has done to save us from the negative parts here, that should also give us a great deal of joy. But that isn't precisely what he was pointing to here. But look, let's look at what he says in verse 1 and then in verses 4 and 5. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And skipping to verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, Jesus here was using an image, obviously, that was very familiar to them because they lived in an agricultural community. They had grapevines growing everywhere. And this isn't altogether unfamiliar to us. If you just look out the window as you're driving down the road, we see all kinds of agriculture, don't we? And I'm sure that you've driven by some grapevines if you don't actually have some on your property uh, somewhere. Now, Jesus is using the analogy of the relationship of a vine to its branches. If branches are to produce grapes, those branches that grow off the vine, they have to be connected to the vine, quite obviously, because they need the sap, they need the life that the vine provides. It has to flow down to the branches to provide the nutrients and everything else that are necessary for the grapes actually to grow. Well, Jesus is telling us in the same way that if we are to produce fruit, if we are to obey, we need to be connected to the vine, the, with a capital V, we need to be connected to Jesus. We need the life power, or I should say that basically the life-giving power that comes from Him, from His Holy Spirit, because the Spirit of God is the one who comes from Jesus, comes through this connection, and gives us the ability to do this. Without this connection to Jesus, without His Holy Spirit, we cannot do anything. And what Jesus means by that is we cannot do anything good. There are things we can still do, but nothing that God is interested in, nothing that He wants. We can still sin without being connected to Jesus. I mean, we can disobey God. We can do the right things, even the right things, but we do them for the wrong reasons. But we cannot do good. The right things for the right reasons. We can't obey Him out of love. We can't obey Him out of a desire to bring Him honor. And again, that's why Jesus says in verse 5 at the end, apart from me, you can do nothing. Remember Jesus said back in John chapter 6, the flesh profits nothing. It is the Spirit who gives life. Without the Spirit, you cannot do anything good. Now, again, that's because of our condition when we came into the world. Remember, the Lord tells us we came into the world dead in sin, spiritually dead and unable to do anything pleasing to God. We were dead to obedience. We didn't want to obey God, but we were alive to disobedience. We loved to sin. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, and I want you to notice Paul includes himself in this because this was once his condition apart from Jesus Christ. But right into the Ephesians, he says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, Paul means by that not only were we the children of wrath, and we were under God's wrath, and we would have been destroyed if He hadn't changed our course, but what he meant is we had the, the nature of the children of wrath, which means we love sin. We love disobedience. We wanted to do only those things, basically, that were displeasing to God. And again, I'm not saying that people who are not believers never do anything that is outwardly good. They just don't do it for the right reasons, which means they don't do anything that is truly good. 
Now, when we were in this condition, Paul tells us that we could not do anything pleasing to God. Again, the flesh profits nothing. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 7 through 8, The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You see, if, if all you have is the flesh, if you don't have the Spirit, if you're not connected to Christ, that's all you can do. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we are the, to have the power to do good and to produce the kind of fruit that is pleasing to God, we have to be connected to the vine. We have to be in Jesus and we have to have His Spirit working through us. Of course, if we're connected to Jesus, the Spirit who actually connects us to Him. And once we're connected to Him, the Spirit of God flows through us and gives us the ability to do what is good. Now again, the only way that we can be connected to Jesus Christ is by faith. We must be willing to turn away from our disobedience. We must trust Jesus alone to save us and we must begin to follow Him. We must do what it is He wants us to do. And of course, we can only do that by the Spirit. As I've said, He's the one that has to connect us to Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of heaven. Unless he's born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have to have a natural birth, but you also have to have a spiritual rebirth to see and to enter. But once we are connected to Jesus through this new birth, once we are abiding in Him, and He is abiding in us, dwelling in us, the Spirit, His Spirit, will flow into our souls and give us the power to do what He calls us to do. Now again, there is a caveat here. We won't be able to do it perfectly. We won't be able to live perfectly. But we will be able to obey Him with a genuine love and a real desire to honor Him in our hearts. And since we now love Him and since we are now obeying Him, that brings us joy, as well as everything else Jesus said leading up to this point. Now, Jesus tells us there's other things here that will bring us joy as well. He says if we are connected to Him, we'll not only bear fruit, but we will bear much fruit. And that will, of course, be determined by how much of His Spirit is actually flowing through us. And that depends on a number of things, how, how much we use those ways that God gives us to get more of the influence of His Holy Spirit, how much we turn away from our sins and fight against them because every time we give in, we lose some of that influence of the Holy Spirit. And the more we lose, the less we'll be able to do for Him. But the more we gain, the more we abide in Jesus Christ and, as it were, look to Him through this connection by faith, the more we will gain that help of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus says, if we are connected to Him, we will not only bear fruit, but we will bear much fruit. We will have and can have, I can't say we're all necessarily going to experience it right away because we know that there are differences in how we feel from day to day. And again, that has to do with how much of the spirit we have and perhaps how much physical energy we have as well. But we will have the power to do a lot for him. Look again at verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Now, if doing a little for His glory and for that of His Father gives us joy, just think how much joy we'll have when we're able to do more for His glory. I mean, if you love the Lord, don't you want to serve Him? You want to serve Him. You want to do something for His glory. The thing that grieves us the most is the fact that we're not doing more that we're not bearing more fruit, that we're letting so many opportunities pass us by or we don't have the strength or the desire. It grieves us, but when we are filled with the Spirit and we, we, we love Him and we do more, it brings us joy because that is what we really want to do. Every Christian wants to do this to some degree. We need to be able or, or desire to do it as much as possible. Now, 
If we bear a lot of fruit, Jesus tells us in verse 8 that our joy will be even greater because it will also prove to us that we really do belong to Him, that we really are His disciples, that we really are new creatures in Christ, saved by His grace, that we really have been delivered from the punishment that would be ours for our sins, which we're going to look at in just a few moments, and that we are on our way safely to heaven. Notice what Jesus says in verse 8. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. That glorifies the Father when you bear much fruit, but when you bear much fruit, it also proves that you belong to Him. It proves it to the world. That is the witness. Remember, by this they will know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. But it also proves to us that we are His disciples. Because if we are barren branches that bear absolutely no fruit, uh, if, we, if a tree is known by its fruits, then where's the evidence that we actually belong to Him? If we don't see any fruit, either we don't know what we're looking for, or there's no fruit. But either way, we're not going to have the joy that's going to come from knowing that we belong to Him, which is strongly proven or evidenced by the fact that our lives are actually bearing fruit and much fruit. It, it's a joy to be able to bear or to do a lot for Jesus because you love Him. Now, if we are bearing good fruit, if we are trusting Jesus and doing what He tells us to do in His Word, He tells us also something else that will bring us joy, and that is that we can ask for whatever we want, and He will give it to us. You know, I like the way that Jesus keeps repeating this promise because we need it. We need some encouragement and we need to be encouraged to pray. But here is another uh, promise the Lord gives to us to increase our joy because it will help us serve Him better. He says in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, again, we saw recently that He will do these things because the things that we will ask for if we are in Christ and He is in us by His Holy Spirit, the things we will ask for are the things He wants us to have. We're, we're not going to treat Jesus the way He is treated in, in you know, some churches where He's kind of like a cosmic genie. You know, we, they take verses like this and they think Jesus is saying to us, your wish is my command, and so command what you will, and I'll do it for you. That's not what we have here. If we are obedient servants who love Jesus and want to serve Him, He says we can ask and He will graciously give us the things we need to be able to serve Him and love Him better so that our joy might be filled and so that He might be glorified and His Father glorified. That's a lot different than the way this is being interpreted in a lot of different even, well, churches, sadly. But, of course, as we see the answers to prayer, because He abides in us and we in Him and because we're doing His will, we see the answers to this prayer. Not only the promise gives us joy, but especially the answers to those prayers. Because when we pray and ask for even more power and greater effect and we see it, it gives us greater reason to rejoice in the Lord because we're being more fruitful for Him. And Jesus goes on to say, so that we won't stop bearing fruit, he says the Father promises to continually prune us. That, he says, is his Father's work, so that we will bear more and more fruit. Look again at verses 1 and 2. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Notice the purpose of the pruning is good. More fruit, that's what we want, more fruit, right? So the pruning is good. Now the pruning isn't always easy. It's not an easy thing to go through because the way God prunes usually is through trials and discipline. Why is it that when you're you know, rushed in a hurry, everything begins to turn against you. Why is it that you are constantly subjected to the things you have the most difficulty dealing with? It's 
because the Lord is training you. He is bringing trials in order to train you, in order to help you to grow so that you may bear more fruit. So the sooner you submit to those things and learn the lessons, the sooner you can move on. And I'm speaking to myself mainly. There are so many things that you just have to be confronted with so many times before you say, you know what? This can't be happening by chance. The Lord is bringing these things. I need it. So what do I need to learn? Patience usually. We need patience. But he does it so that we will produce more fruit. It's hard, but the results are worth it because we will be able to do more. You know, you think of that expression that we often hear, no pain, no gain. We have to, in the Christian life, do the same thing. We have to go through the pain of pruning in order to go through the gain or the gaining of the ability to do more for Him. Now, there's one last thing along these lines. Um, Actually, there's maybe a couple more, but one last thing along those lines of pruning that maybe we don't recognize as pruning right away. Look at what Jesus told His disciples in in verse 3. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now, that almost seems to be out of place. What is Jesus talking about? Well, that word clean there is the same word used for pruning. You see, the Father, when He prunes, is is really cleansing you of sin. He's he's weaning you of sin. He's, He's helping you to put to death your sins and to overcome sins. Jesus is talking about the same thing here to His disciples. He is telling them they have already been cleansed, they have already been pruned so that they are ready to produce fruit because Jesus has already pruned them through His Word. Now, that's another way that the Father actually works in us is through the Word, but this is another way that we can actually, I believe, uh, do the work ourselves so that maybe the Father doesn't have to do quite as much of it because let's say if, if one has difficulty with uh, driving on the road, I mean, how many people can't resonate with that? Uh, the way people drive, the stoplights, the number of stoplights, the fact that they always turn red against you most of the time. And, I mean, the Lord is teaching us patience, you know. Well, what are we going to do? We can disregard what God says in His Word and we can just simply keep trying to make those lights green and and do what we can to get through them and continually face red light after red light after red light and and get frustrated. Or we can just simply submit to what God says in His Word. We need to learn patience and just know that when God brings these things, He brings them for a reason. He's even in control of the stoplights and in everything that's going on in your lives. So when you submit to that and you, you, you correct yourself, you discipline yourself, then you don't need the Lord to do the other, you see. Now, He'll still do it. He'll still do His work, but He will do less of it if we do more. If we discipline ourselves, we will need to be disciplined less by Him. And what I mean by that is not taking a whip and whipping your back like Luther did when he was an Augustinian monk, you know. That's the way he kind of thought discipline was to take place. And when I say that God won't discipline us, I'm not saying that He's... You know, not just the the chastisement, as it were, for the things we've done that are wrong, but I'm talking about discipline in the broad sense that he means it, which is instruction, correction, nurture, training. You see, if, if we will accept that instruction from the Word of God, then we won't need... God to bring it from the outside, as it were, and and put us in situations where we're going to learn those lessons anyway. So we can be self-disciplined by reading the Word of God and submitting to it. Now, Jesus says one more thing to encourage us in verses 9 and 10. He says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Now, I do believe Jesus is saying something that's a little bit different here than what He had been saying before. Now, He said before that if we abide in Him, if we're connected to Him and His Spirit is working in us, we will bear much fruit and we will be filled with His joy. Now, here He tells us that if we keep His commandments which is the same thing as bearing good fruit, we will abide in His love. Now, we keep His commandments to show Him that we love Him. 
But he says if we keep his commandments, he will show us that he loves us. Just as he kept his father's commandments and the father showed him that he loved him. Remember what the father said when Jesus was baptized? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And why was the father doling all that love out upon his son? Because his son was obedient. There's a connection between our obedience and the love that the Lord has for us and shows to us. When we keep his commandments, we show that we love him, but when we keep his commandments, we see his love for us. Now, there's three things that this could mean, and I'm just going to go through these quickly. Each of them are true, whether this is what Jesus was teaching. I think he's teaching one or all of these things. First of all, that he will love us if we obey him. Now, this, you know, again, the, the, the kind of love that Jesus has for his children, I think, is what he's talking about here, not the broad love that he has for all mankind, but he does have a special love for his children because his image is being formed in them, and that image is expressed by obedience. He will love us if we obey him. Okay? Now, the good news is we will obey him if we are trusting him. Because if we're trusting Him, we're connected to Him, His Holy Spirit is running through us, and we will not only obey, but we will obey much. We will bear much fruit. And, of course, doing that and being a child of His, He will love us, okay? That's one thing it can mean. Or He could mean the more we obey Him, the more we will love us. Now, Jesus loves all of His children. This is something that we need to understand as well. He doesn't necessarily love all of them exactly the same. Jesus had his favorites. Did you ever see that in Scripture? What, were there any among his disciples that he seemed to favor among the others, like those three that he would often take aside and, and do certain things with them, show, him, show them his glory or pray with him in the garden? And even his favorites weren't able to stay awake. But Jesus has his favorites, and his favorites are those who obey him more. Now, they may attempt more and fail more, but they are trying because they, they love Him. So, if we love the Lord, that fact should encourage us to love Him more and obey Him more because He loves that obedience. Or He could mean this, that through our disobedience, or excuse me, through our obedience, we will sense more of His love, that we will feel in, in an experiential way that love for Him. You know what happens when you don't obey the Lord? Can you sense the love that Jesus Christ has for you when you don't obey Him? Well, when you quench and grieve the Holy Spirit, which is the love of Christ within us, you, you don't sense it. You sense less of it. And it's when you're walking with Him in obedience that you sense more of it. Uh, another term in Scripture that is used to describe it is God's countenance. He, it's, you sense it as though he's looking at you, almost like he's smiling at you. Um, that is something we can experience, but you don't experience when you're that when you're disobeying him, when you're grieving and quenching the Spirit of God, you experience it when you're walking with him. So Jesus could mean that. But at the very least, all three of these are three more reasons why we should obey him, that we might experience that joy, the joy of knowing that we are pleasing him and the joy of, of just his countenance, as it were, <clears throat> shining upon us. Now, this is pretty much where the, the section on joy ends, and I want to deal with the other part of it, and I'm just going to deal with it briefly. Okay, so far we've looked at what Jesus has to say about those who obey him. Now, what about those who don't? Okay, here's, here's where the, <laughs> you know... It gets a little bit heavier here because this is negative. Okay? There are negative things in the Bible. There are warnings that we need to take heed of. And by the way, I think I mentioned to you before that it's this backdrop of what we actually deserve apart from the Lord Jesus Christ that makes His love so glorious, makes it so beautiful. And the fact that He has saved us and given us love and allowed us to bear this fruit and given us this glorious future and all these wonderful promises, well, those would be great even if we didn't deserve death or damnation or life, if we were just kind of neutral. 
But we get all these things with a backdrop of absolute sin and judgment, which is the pit that he dug us out of. What if we stay in the pit? What if we don't obey him? Well, what about those who don't, okay? And now Jesus here is talking about Israel, I think, and he's, he's talking about the fact that it was, they were his church, but not everybody in his church was necessarily connected to him. As a matter of fact, most of them weren't. But they claimed to be God's people, and they claimed to be in the church, right? They said, they didn't say this, but in our terms today, we've trusted Jesus, we've joined with the church, but they're not actually living a different life. They're not producing any good fruit, any useful fruit. They're not showing any love towards God. They're not showing love towards their neighbor. Uh, what does Jesus have to say about them? People who claim to be in the vine, who claim to be connected to Christ, but aren't really bearing any fruit. What's going to happen? Well, he says, first of all, the Father is eventually going to remove them. Remember how John says in 1 John, they went out from us because they're never really of us. They went out from us because, probably because of what Jesus says here in verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. You see, eventually, it's time to get rid of that dead branch, you know, and it's gone. Now, what happens to the branches once they're disconnected, once they're, they're put out, as it were? Well, he says they're eventually going to be cast into the fire. Now, I do want you to notice one thing here. A lot of people read these, this passage and they say that these branches are the dead fruits of believers and their dead works are being thrown into the fire and being burned up. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Branches are people, people who say they're connected to Jesus or people who really are connected to Jesus. Well, the branches that don't bear fruit are people who aren't really connected to Jesus. So what's going to happen to the branches? Well, verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire. And they are burned. Now, I hope you can see it's perfectly clear here. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch. Branches are people. They're not dead works. Okay, they are people. They are unbelievers who have not trusted in Jesus. And just, Jesus is saying, just as useless branches that are dead are pruned off the vine, not to take up space so we can have new growth and so forth, and burned, so those who have not trusted Jesus Christ are eventually going to be thrown into the fire. Now, I'll give you ten guesses as to what that means. They're going to be thrown into the eternal fire. Now, we don't rejoice in the fact that that's going to happen, but it is going to happen. Now, on the day of judgment, there is a sense in which we will because everyone who is cast into the fire, who is an enemy of God, deserves what they're getting. But as Jesus tells us now, love your neighbor as you love yourself, we care about them. We don't want them to have to go there, you see. We want to save them from that. So what Jesus is saying here is this, that simply saying you believe in Jesus is not enough. Becoming a member of a church is not enough if you're not trusting Jesus, if you're not connected to Him, if you're not abiding in Him, if His Spirit is not in you, if you are not then producing good fruit, then you are still in that condition that we saw that we are all in when we came into the world. You're still in your sins. The Lord has not forgiven you. And when you die, Jesus says the angels are going to go through his kingdom. They're going to gather up everyone that doesn't belong to him, all the tares, and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. The Lord is going to throw you into hell. It's not a matter of people just walking off the pre precipice and falling into the, into the lake. They are positively put there by the Lord as an act of his judgment through his angels and everybody who goes into the lake, none of them ever come out. They will suffer forever. Now, 
the same is, is true with regard to those who have never claimed to be Christians. You don't have to be somebody who's professing to be Christ and a member of a church and say that you're connected to the vine, but you really aren't in order to suffer, as it were, this fate. This is true of everyone who has not trusted Jesus Christ, because if you don't trust him, you will get one day exactly what your disobedience deserves. I mean, God is not being overly severe here. This is what your sins actually deserve. This is what you deserve. This is what I deserved. This is what we all deserved when we came into the world because we were rebels against the infinitely holy and gracious God. But you see, the good news is, and this is where it shines so brightly when you look at the dark backdrop, you can escape this judgment if you turn from your disobedience, trust in the Lord Jesus, and if you do this, you can know that He will receive you, He will forgive you, He will give you His Holy Spirit, and you will obey Him and experience His joy. So ask yourself this morning, what do you want? Lake of fire or fullness of joy? It really depends on your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want that joy? Then you must repent, turn away from your sins, trust in Jesus. And if you will do that, He will save you. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply this. Again, we saw joy. Don't let what we just looked at, for, you know, a lot out of our minds, what we saw earlier. There is joy to be had, joy in bearing fruit, but we must trust in the Lord Jesus. So let's pray that the Lord, on the one hand, will give us the grace to be able to bear more fruit. And on the other hand, let's remember that if we're not trusting Jesus, there isn't joy, there is only fear. The fear of what God will do to those who have not turned from their sins and trusted Jesus, He will give you what you deserve. And you don't want what you deserve. What you want is what Jesus deserves. Well, let's bow and, and we'll pray silently and then I'll, I'll close that time with prayer.